So I was at the Turner Falls Fishway on Sunday morning and I saw my first shad uh, this spring. I was awed by the ability of this fish to find its way back to the Connecticut River. These fish deserve my respect as master travelers. Like John Hay, I felt like I was watching a professional from an old water world. So I'd like to talk a little bit tonight about American shad and sea lamprey. They are the fish that are most common that we see at the Turner's Falls Fishway. And I'd like to uh, talk about their life history and their contributions to the ecology of the Connecticut River watershed. Uh, this program takes place as the upriver journey of these two fish is underway. Sea lamprey and, and American shad are anadromous fish, and that means that they're born in the fresh water of the river. They migrate to the sea to mature as an adult, and then they return to the freshwater river to spawn. Uh, that's unusual. So these fish are unusual in that they migrate between freshwater and saltwater and back. Most fish spend all their life in a lake or a pond or a river or the ocean. They don't go back and forth between salt water and fresh water. American shad and sea lamprey are two of the diatomous fish or migratory fish that we have in the Connecticut River watershed. I'd like to chat a little bit about some of the other fish just to introduce them, and I'll focus on shad and sea lamprey tonight. Uh, blueback herring and alewives are grouped, they're uh, river herring species. They're in the same family, the herring family, as American shad, and they're smaller cousins. Blueback herring and alewives look quite a bit alike. Um, alewives are the earlier migrants, so they tend to migrate in April into um, small coastal, coastal rivers. They don't go that far inland. And blueback herring migrate a little bit later. They'll migrate later in May, um, and they're going to migrate farther upriver. Atlantic salmon is another species that was once a little bit more common in the Connecticut River watershed. It disappeared in the early 1800s from the Connecticut River. It's their southernmost um, river. They're really a northern cold water species. Disappeared in the early 1800s. And in the late 1960s, there was a restoration program for the Atlantic salmon that was discontinued in 2012 um, due to low numbers of returning adults. Striped bass. I think of that as a fish that sort of looks like it's wearing striped pajamas. Um, it can be quite a, quite a large fish. Most of the striped bass breed in the Chesapeake Bay region. A smaller population breeds in the Hudson River. Um, the striped bass that we have in the Connecticut River are really here to feed and grow. They're not here as much. Their primary focus is not a spawning run. Um, large striped bass are found below the Holyoke Dam, uh, feeding on a lot of the migratory fish and other fish. Um, Bass a little bit larger, um, small bass called schoolies, will, may go through the Holyoke Lift and are in the river really more to feed. Short-nosed sturgeon is another anadromous fish that we have in the river. They, it looks kind of like a Dr. Seuss fish, um, rather odd looking um, fish, and it can live up to 35 years of age. Uh, Short-nosed sturgeon were never found above the Great Falls or above the Turner's Falls area. Historically, there's never been a population. An American eel, the last fish on the list, uh, looks similar to lamprey in terms of the shape. Some people will call sea lamprey, lamprey eels. American eels are actually very, very different species. They're patagomous, which means they're born in the salt water. So they're born in the Sargasso Sea. They migrate up the freshwater rivers up and down the coast to mature to an adult, and then they return to the Sargasso Sea. So they return back to the ocean uh, to spawn. So they have the opposite lifestyle. So all of these fish um, migrate between freshwater and saltwater. So to focus on the American shad, the Latin name is Alosa sapidissima, Alosa of the herring family, and sapidissima means most delicious. Uh, shad is a very tasty fish, and it's prized for its meat and as well for its roe, for the eggs. The American shad is the largest member of the herring family and is found in rivers and coastal waters from Canada, Florida. So taking a look at the Great Falls, which was a 40 foot drop, a pretty steep drop, a waterfall in the Connecticut River um, that was between present day Gill and Turner's Falls. Archaeological evidence of shad taken in Riverside, so Riverside is the Gill side above the falls, above the Roaring Falls. 
Um, so archaeological evidence going back in that location dates shad being fished for um, by at least 7,000 BC. So we're talking almost 9,000 years um, going forward of shad being fished for at the base of the falls and shad being a common fish there. Keskiemskut, it was a place for peaceful assembly of the Great Falls, for fishing and spiritual renewal. In the Pakumtuk heartland, where indigenous people from throughout the Northeast and beyond gathered at this place of abundance each spring. In the colonial days, uh, shad were also very common and very important for fishing. Um, a quote from the Mount Vernon Journal in 1793, talks about the surface of the water sparkling like silver as millions of fish swam up river. On the Potomac River, George Washington's fishery, um, primarily from the spring shad and herring run was more lucrative than the farming, although Mount Vernon is best known for the farming. Uh, they used fish weirs and seine nets and caught shad by the thousands. Similar reports from early colonists along the Connecticut River. So this was really true up and down the Eastern Sea. John McPhee wrote a book about shad called The Founding Fish, and he's nicknamed uh, shad the founding fish because it's such a part of our heritage. Uh, the spring shad run up the Delaware River and its tributaries helped provide sustenance to winter weary troops during the American Revolution. And up and down the East Coast and river communities, people depended on spring shad, the spring shad run for food. This was certainly true here along the Connecticut River. The spring shad run was woven into the fabric of life up and down the coast. The populations of this once abundant fish began to decline in the 1800s from a combination of damp construction, overfishing, and pollution. The first dam to span the Connecticut was built to bypass the Great Falls. Here in present day Turner's Falls, a canal and locks were built to make it less expensive and quicker to move products up and down the river. Flatboats carrying food, sugar, rum, molasses, iron, and other products were a common sight along the Connecticut River. Unfortunately for migratory fish, they could no longer get past the falls. And then in the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution came to the Connecticut River. The first river spanning structure to harness the Connecticut River for its power generating potential was built at Hadley Falls in what is now present day Holyoke. This is a view of the first, the wooden crib dam that was constructed at Hadley Falls um, to power the new manufacturing city of Holyoke. Many of these dams built in the 1800s for mechanical power blocked the fish passage. So this dam is located 86 miles from the mouth of the river. So at this point from 1849 on, uh, migratory fish were not able to get past this point. Many of the dams built in the 1800s for mechanical power were rebuilt in the 1900s to generate hy hydroelectricity. A similar story played out throughout New England. The construction of fish ladders and lifts at hydroelectric dams more recently have since helped migratory fish expand their spawning range. So taking a look at shad, they're now migrating up the river. They're in Turner's Falls, they're going through. Um, their only goal is to reproduce. Uh, this spring, we have a live feed from the viewing windows of the Turner's Falls Fishway, which can be viewed on a TV monitor from the canal side bike trail. So male shad average about two pounds, females are larger. They average about four pounds. In looking at the photo, the one on the top in the center is a female. She's quite a bit larger than the male that's below. Um, the female has that round belly and she is just filled with eggs. About a third of her body weight is eggs, which amazes me. So if I was 150 pounds and I was pregnant, I would be carrying a 50 pound baby. I mean, her ability to swim and continue on upriver carrying that much weight um, and eggs is just amazing. They have a range of approximately three to seven years old. Their average is about four to five years returning to the Connecticut River. 
They're schooling fish, so they like to travel in schools. They like to be in groups. And right now they're on the Connecticut River. They're on their spawning run and they don't eat. So as soon as they enter the river, the fresh water from the ocean, they stop eating. So they're just using these built uh, fat reserves and, and expending a tremendous amount of energy continuing upriver. Trout have an extra layer of bones and it makes them very difficult to fillet. According to the Mi'kmaqs, uh, shad was originally a discontented porcupine that was thrust into the water. That legend is a reference to its many extra bones. The shad will continue to run until the river's water temperatures reach about 65 degrees, which is their peak spawning temperature. It's now about 58 or so degrees. So let's look at their journey upriver. They enter the Connecticut River in early spring, usually in April, when the water temperature reaches about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. These fish are very much driven by water temperature. The water temperature of the river really controls their life. So they continued up, they entered in April, and then it got cold in late April and early May this year. Um, we had heavy rains and it was also colder temperatures. And so the fish passage really slowed down. The fish were not driven to continue to head up river. Um, the rains have stopped, the turbidity has decreased, and so the run is now sort of in full swing or just starting, especially in the Turner's area. They'll continue up river until early to mid-June, spawning, their peak spawning is 65. They can continue to about 68 and then they'll stop. The young will head to the ocean in the fall and Ideally, if all things work well for them, return to the river to spawn three to six years later. The average would be about four to five years. So 86 miles from the ocean. So they've left the ocean, they've swum 86 miles against the current in the Connecticut River, and they reach Hadley Falls, what's now the Holyoke Dam. There are two elevators there that offer them a ride, so they literally take an elevator ride to bypass the Holyoke They then can swim 35 miles farther upriver. At this point, they're 125 miles from the sea when they reach a series of fish ladders in Turner's Falls. This journey may have taken them over a month, depending on river flows and temperatures. So this is a view of the spillway fish ladder. There are 42 steps in the ladder, and each step or each pool in this fish ladder is approximately one foot higher than the preceding pool. So that way the fish are able to swim up the pool one step at a time or one foot at a time. Much like us, if we wanted to scale a wall, we could put a ladder against that wall and then climb the ladder one rung at a time. Um, each of these pools is about 10 feet by 10 feet. Once they head up the spillway ladder, swim through the gatehouse ladder, then they swim by the viewing windows at the Turner's Falls Fishway. Um, there's Charlie, the fishway guides, and there's a lamprey in the middle window. This year, unfortunately, because of the uh, space at the fishway is inside, is quite confined and small, and we're not able to safely social distance, um, we're not able to open the fishway. We do have a live TV monitor that can be viewed from the canal side by So in a few weeks, maybe quicker, maybe later, you never know because of the weather in New England. And if we all know anything, the weather is somewhat undependable. Um, the fish reaching about 65 degrees when the water temperature has warmed up uh, will, will spawn. Uh, peak romance hours for shad are dusk to midnight. They tend to spawn in shallow water, about four to eight feet. Um, this can be in the main stem of the river in slow moving, sort of slow moving areas of the river with a gravel or sandy bottom. And the main stem or also could be near the mouth or up a little bit of some of the main tributaries. So that could be the Deerfield, the Westfield, um, the West River, some of the major tributaries. They broadcast spawn. The males splash at the surface and spread their cloud of milt around the emerging eggs from the female. So they don't construct a nest, such as the sea lamprey and some other fish could do. The eggs slowly sink to the bottom 
and hatch about six days later. Again, that's going to be dependent on the river temperature. They have a yolk sac that can nourish them for the first few weeks of their life. And on average, a female in the Connecticut River, a uh, female shad, can lay over 300,000 eggs. That's a lot of eggs, that's a lot of young fish, and that's a lot of food. And that food is an important part of the aquatic food chain. Um, fish that will feed on shad include minnows, shiners, sunfish, small and large mouth bass, catfish, trout, pike, perch, stripers. If you like to fish, you got to like shad. And a lot of people also enjoy fishing for shad. A lot of fish eating birds. Um, insects may feed off the young fish, um, birds especially, and mammals as well. The estimate is that 90% of the fish in the river eat young shad. And 90% of what is in other fish's stomachs are larval shad, so are really young shad. The young shad, as they're developing throughout the summer and fall in the river, feed on the river zooplankton. So they feed on the tiny plants and tiny animals in the plankton. And then as the river temperatures cool down in the fall, usually in mid to late um, fall, the fish will head to sea. Let me grab the laser pointer. Um, so the fish will head down the Connecticut River. These are the young shad. They'll head down in huge numbers and they'll join the fish coming out of the Bay of Fundy and they'll hang out in this area in the winter that's approximately, it's called the Mid-Atlantic Bight. It's approximately in between Cape Cod and the North Carolina coast. Uh, they'll feed and grow during the winter and then in the spring they'll continue up the coast if a shad is sexually mature and it can return to its natal river, the river of its birth, to breed. If not, it'll continue all the way up to the Bay of Funding. And it will do this trip perhaps three, four, five, even six years, returning to the river of its birth. So why do almost all the shad go to the Bay of Fundy? And why is it such an important um, place for the shad. Um, they believe that all shad spend time in the Bay of Fundy and some shad can spend a considerable amount of time there. It's a funnel-shaped basin, a funnel-shaped bay. It's got the right width and depth for the tides to slosh in twice a day and it just sloshes all the way up and sloshes all the way out. It has amazing tides. Um, it has the highest observed tides in the world, up to 38 feet. And that massive muddy tides means there's lots of sediment and lots of food. So the question I have is to see if you can find the people in this tidal shot in the Bay of Fundy. If you look at that island in the middle that's been sort of just cast up there by the receding water from the tides, um, especially as you get in the upper end of the Bay of Fundy, it's this red mud. Um, you'll see a person in red and a person in blue just down below that center island to the left. But that photo gives you a sense of the scale of the tides. Um, that area is incredibly rich in plankton, lots of food for the shad to feed on. It's also, as you go farther up in the upper basin, it's got this murky water, um, so it's hard to see. But that doesn't seem to bother the shad. It actually works for the shad because there's less competition for the food. And one of the reasons it works for the shad is they have gill rakers. So these are in their gill arches, what covers and protects their gills. Uh, the photo on the left is of a gill raker. They're, they're bony projections that resemble a long, finely toothed comb. And they efficiently filter the food from the water while shad swim with their mouth open. So what that does is if you look at a picture of a shad, a photograph or this illustration, you almost always see shad um, with their mouth open. And that's how they swim. That water comes right through, forced through the gill arches. They get the oxygen from the water and they very efficiently filter out all the plankton so that they then have that. And that's what they feed on while they're in the ocean. And then they return to the river of the birth. So a shad that was born in the Connecticut River will most likely return to the Connecticut River from the Susquehanna River, will return to the Susquehanna, from the Potomac will return to the Potomac. 
They do not feed on the rough river journey. They're just relying on that energy base, on that fat um, uh, to live off of during that upstream journey. And they may return again to spawn. So unlike Pacific salmon, unlike sea lamprey, unlike some species where as soon as the adults return and spawn, they die. There's no choice in their life. Chad, if they have enough energy reserves, they may return to the ocean and return again to spawn. Um, most don't. Most are exhausted by the trip and don't have the energy reserves. I always look forward to seeing the shad bush bloom. Usually in our area, it's in about mid-April, and it signals the beginning of the shad migration. And shad bush, another name for shad bush is service berry. Um, the fact that the shrub common up and down the East Coast is called shad bush, attests to the importance historically of the shad migration um, along the East Coast. It's also the same time that another migratory fish is also entering the river, and that's the sea lamprey. Sea lamprey, Petromyzen marinus. Petromyzen means rock sucker, and marinus of the sea, so rock sucker of the sea. So it gives you a sense of what this fish does. It spends some time um, attached to rocks or moving rocks, and that would be in the fresh water, and marinus, it spends time traveling in the ocean. So looking at sea lamprey, they enter the Connecticut River in early spring. They continue up the river. Um, usually they'll build a nest in June. Um, those nests are usually built in the tributary, so gravelly, rocky bottom areas. Um, they can build a nest in the main stem, if it, main, stem, main stem of the Connecticut River if it's a shallow sort of gravelly area. And they will, after constructing the nest, mate, spawn, and die. Lamprey are possibly the oldest and least changed living vertebrate on Earth. Swimming the seas long before dinosaurs roamed the earth. Looking back at a lamprey is like looking back in a time capsule. 360 million years. They belong to an ancient order of jawless fish. Lampreys are survivalists. They have a minimum of parts arranged simply. It's unnecessary to change to be successful. If it works, why fix it? So lamprey support their body with cartilage versus bones, which is true with most fish. They also have round gill holes. You'll count seven on each side. And so they take in the water just right through those holes. They're a bizarre looking fish. They have a jawless mouth. Um, fish usually have paired jaws. They have this round suction mouth instead of the paired jaws. They don't have paired fins. Those are all traits that we associate with fish. All of those traits evolved later. It has one single nose. You can see that right in the middle of the face. Point that out. There's the nose. And it also has two eyes. And you can see those eyes are starting to cloud over. So on their upriver journey, the sea lamprey are really, their bodies are really starting to break down. And you can see this as they swim by. They're often. I'm starting to go blind. It, they also have a light sensitive eye. You can see right there, that light spot. Um, that helps them orient as they're going blind. That helps them orient and continue upriver. They're truly an unusual looking fish. So June is the end and the beginning of life, usually for sea lamprey and our tributaries. Uh, they construct a nest, they mate, spawn, and die, drifting into the currents, um, becoming food for many scavengers. They use their round suction mouth to build a rock dam that could be about a foot tall. Um, it's in, it would be in a C shape on the downstream end of their nest. And that will catch the eggs as they drift downstream. They clear an area for a nest that's called a red. It's approximately three feet long, um, and they'll sort of clear the, out the rocks from that area. It'll be shallower. And that uh, red is upstream, so upriver from the rock. 
from their rock dam that they construct for the nest. The male sea lamprey, lamprey will wind around the female below her head, squeeze and wriggle, fertilizing her eggs with his milk as the eggs are being released. This can take place over a 24 hour period and over 200,000 eggs can be deposited in their nest in the bottom of the river. Um, this is something I had the opportunity to see, which was great. It was along the Fort River um, in Amherst and had spent the whole day trying to find this. And it was just amazing to stand in the water um, and just watch um, this activity. Mid-June is a good time to check it out. So those eggs will develop into amicetes, which is a young lamprey. And for many years, uh, this brown worm was called Amicete branchialis, and they thought it was a totally different species. They didn't realize that it was a sea lamprey, but just a young form of the sea lamprey. It looks like a brown worm wearing a hoodie. It filter feeds, and it uh, will just burrow down in the soft sediments, so will drift down steam, downstream from the rocky nest, burrow down in the soft sediments or the muds in the bottom of the river and just filter feed. It'll face upriver. So as the currents come down river to it, it'll filter feed. Um, it can live up to 10 years in tributaries in the Connecticut River, it averages about four years. So it'll spend four years of its life in the bottom of these freshwater tributaries. As it grows, it'll wriggle up, wriggle out. Usually they move at night, head downstream, find another place, wriggle down in, and face upstream. And so they'll continue to do this as they feed and grow. They essentially just an oral hood. If you go back to that image of a brown worm wearing a hoodie, it's really just the hood with a hole in it. Um, that water just comes in, it filter feeds. They're blind, um, they don't have eyes. They're, you never know, they were a sea lamprey. And then they go through a transformation stage. It can take approximately three months. It's a pretty significant metamorphosis. They change color. Um, they change from the brown to this sort of green-like camouflage that'll blend more in with the, the main river and the ocean. They develop a mouth, a round suction-like mouth with teeth. They develop eyes, kidneys, fins, and they, so they go through this um, significant transformation. They will be about four years old and they're about six inches long. So they're approximately the size of a number two pencil. In the ocean, they live a very different life. They're nicknamed vampires of the sea. They're parasitic. They attach and feed on host fish and they have sort of taken advantage of this high protein niche in the ocean. So they will often find, they'll find schooling fish, attach and feed on that fish. Um, and then when they have had a full meal, detach and attach again on another fish. You can see the mouth. So this concentric row of teeth will just latch right in and, and latch onto the skin and the flesh of a fish in the middle is this raspy like tongue. So it's a combination of a drill and a straw, if you will. And so it can go into the um, flesh of the fish and enables it to suck the bodily fluids from the fish. Um, if it is a small fish, it could kill the fish. It doesn't usually. If it's a larger fish, it doesn't usually um, uh, significantly affect the fish. So as an adult in the ocean, the sea lampreys grow, go through a tremendous growth spurt. They'll grow from about six inches to two to three feet in a very short amount of time, in about one to two years at sea. So with the shad, how do they find their way home? Um, they're migrating up and down the river, migrated along the coast, and they use olfactory cues. So they're able to taste and smell the water. Before they left in the fall, let's say four years ago, 
the shad would imprint on the chemical quality of the water, so of the Connecticut River, um, through taste and smell. And then when they're returning up the coast, they can recognize the chemical imprint of that water and know that that's their, their natal river, know that that's, that's the river of their birth and return up um, that river. With sea lamprey, it's different. Most anadromous fish will return specifically to the area that they were born. How do sea lamprey know? Um, they attach to the fish in the ocean so they don't go through this specific migratory route. And they believe that the way that sea lamprey know that this is a good place to build a home, this is a good place to spawn, is they use pheromones that can help them provide a roadmap. So a sea lamprey would be attracted to the Connecticut River by the pheromones released by larvae, by the amicetes upstream. And the adults can detect it in the estuary, so at the mouth of the river. Uh, the strength of these pheromones, these bile acid-based pheromones, provides a roadmap for the adults so they know where to go. The stronger the strength, the greater the number of larvae, the greater the number of young amicetes reared in the river basin. And then the greater number of adults that will be attracted to enter the river because that if there's a strong pheromone smell that'll tell them that this is a good place to spawn. During the lamprey's migration upriver, they do not feed. Their digestive system breaks down, the enamel caps fall off their teeth, and they go blind. They're only heading upriver for one reason, and that's to reproduce. So this gives a sense of where the lamprey are heading. So they can spawn in the main stem of the river, but they're primarily heading into the tributary. So in this map, they can go all on up to about halfway into Vermont and up the White River. Um, the tributaries are really their main um, spawning grounds and often the tributaries off of the tributaries. So they're looking for rocky bottom rivers um, where they can build their nest. So one question that often comes lamprey is friend or foe. And I think the answer to that question really depends on where you live. Um, sea lamprey return to the fresh water in early spring for their upriver spawning migration. It may take them over two months um, to continue up the river. So the friend or foe question Again, depends on where you live. If you live in the Great Lakes area or Western New York, lamprey um, have historically um, been a problem. The construction of boat canals allowed accidental introduction of lamprey to enter areas where they were not, did not live and areas where they could not return to the ocean. And so what happens is if you look in this maroon area, um, the Great Lakes and especially the upper Great Lakes, um, they were trapped there by the boat canals. And so they can't return to the ocean for that parasitic life stage, life stage. What they do is they use the lake as the ocean and then head up the tributaries, head up the rivers that flow into the lake as you know our Connecticut River. And that's a problem and they've really um, had an impact on the fisheries in the Great Lakes. Um, they tend to be quite a bit smaller in the Great Lakes and they'll attach, the fish are smaller and they will often kill the fish. And they've affected the whitefish, they've affected the trout, they've affected a number of the fish um, that were you know, once thriving, an important fishery in the Great Lakes. So the catch is they can't get back to the ocean. Once they got into the lakes, they were stuck in the lakes. So it's not a free flowing river and that they don't have access to the ocean. Let's switch to New England and to the Connecticut River watershed, where sea lamprey are free to move between fresh water and the ocean. Here in our rivers and streams, they play an important ecological role. They serve as food. They serve as important fer fertilizer. And they serve um, as increasing habitat diversity and likewise biodiversity. So in looking at the food aspect, I want to thank, give a call out to uh, Mary Holland, who very graciously let me um, 
use this photo in the slideshow. Mary Holland is an amazing photographer and writer. She has a blog um, that's free. If you don't get it, I highly recommend it. She'll send, if not daily, many times a week, um, really interesting information about the natural history of New England. And she has a couple of books. Um, one's called Naturally Curious, which is great um, information about anything about natural history that you might want to know. So sea lamprey can be food, but the dead lamprey will drift um, into the current. They're food for scavengers, such as the bald eagle, food for many other, uh, could be mammals, um, raccoons, um, crustaceans, other animals will feed off the dead animals. Anything that's a scavenger so is a really important part of a food chain. The anisetes, those young, so the sea lamprey is gonna lay 200,000 eggs. Some of those will survive. Those young amicetes will live in the tributaries for up to four years. And some of our tributaries, amicetes are the most abundant fish. And so that's a really important base of the aquatic food chain. So that food is really important for many of the other animals that live in that river. They also are important as a fertilizer. And this would be true for shad as well in the river for Lamprey, it's true of the tributaries. Uh, so most nutrients are coming downriver, going down with the current. And what happens when the lamprey enter the rivers in um, May and June is they bring this influx of marine nutrients into the river and up the river at a really critical time for growth and freshwater stream ecosystems. So, you know, June, late May, June is just this amazing time for plant and animal growth in rivers and riparian environments. And so here's this flux, this new fertilizer at the perfect time of year. And lastly, they're ecosystem engineers. Um, they can significantly increase biodiversity in freshwater tributaries and the uh, uh, abundance of many insects. Um, in these freshwater tributaries. So when I'm speaking about locally, that might be the Sawmill River, that might be the Fall River, the Millers River, uh, the Fort River, the West River, the Deerfield, and some of the tributaries off of those rivers as well. So going back to the nest construction, they're moving rocks and they can move rocks as big as my fist. So they're moving rocks, creating these sort of rock mounds, which is that rock dam at the base of their red, the base of their nest. And they're also clearing out areas in the bottom of the river. So they're creating a diversity of habitats in the river bottom. And there was a study done that looked at the five most common insect um, families that made up um, the benthic invertebrates, so made up the insects that lived at the bottom of these freshwater rivers. So this was three quarters of all the insects. And what they found was that if you had sea lamprey building nests and spawning, that it, it increased the density and abundance. And that was still found four months later. So it was still found into September if they were um, constructing their nests in June. And what was really surprising, so they compared where sea lamprey were constructing nests and where they weren't. What was very surprising was the level that the density and abundance increased just from having sea lamprey constructing the nests um, and, you know, and reproducing. So for three of the insect families, one mayfly and two caddis families, it was 10 times greater the density and abundance. For one of the midge families, it was two times greater, so it was twofold. And then for one of the mayfly, mayfly families, there was not a significant difference. That's a pretty amazing um, contribution to the ecology of a freshwater stream. So getting back to the question, is a sea lamprey a friend or foe? Um, definitely in the Connecticut River watershed, there's no question that they are a major friend and they're really an unsung hero of our tributaries. And looking at the ecology of shad as well as lamprey, um, shad play a really important role, role in the aquatic food chain of the river in the, in the ocean. They're an important food in the ocean and also in the river, the young shad, the larval shad throughout the summer and fall are very important. The shad that don't make it back to the river because um, they're exhausted are also an important food for scavengers. And they also, just as the shad do, 
bring in a lot of marine nutrients at this time of growth, so in the spring. So during the next few weeks, as you drive across the Connecticut River or one of its tributaries, walk along its bank or paddle its waters, I invite you to imagine the migration that is taking place underwater. The upriver spawning journey of the American shad and sea lamprey is an incredible natural phenomenon that takes place in our own backyard each spring. 